uh, I'm excited to be here at uh, ADC. This is my first time at ADC. And um, really glad to be connecting with uh, all of you here. So maybe I'll just do a short introduction to myself. My journey in audio began in the late 90s. I'm starting to date myself a little bit here. My interest in audio was uh, basically started in the problem of uh, what I like to call visceral sound control. It's basically being able to control um, sound using uh, uh, sensory input in a way that uh, uh, feels very much like controlling your body. So it's uh, just an overly optimistic person. And I was interested in problems that uh, maybe are actually becoming very uh, interesting to solve today. But I think in the late 90s, it was uh, not a great time to be solving those problems. Maybe it was a fun time to dream about them, but it seems like many of those solutions are taking shape today. So I think, uh, I, I think it takes a lot of patience combined with optimism if uh, you're uh, thinking about problems that are a little too far ahead. Uh, my interest in audio took me to um, McGill, where I pursued uh, music technology. And then eventually, I worked a little bit in the video game industry in electronic arts and at an audio middleware shop called Audio Kinetic. I don't know, maybe some of you here may be working in the uh, video game industry. And uh, after Audio Kinetic, I spent some time uh, running an independent consulting shop, consulting for early stage startups, especially those who were interested in solving some uh, audio problems, especially using uh, new technologies to create uh, user experience that was audio enabled. And after that consulting firm, I started to work with Knowles. And it's been uh, about seven years since I started working with Knowles. So Knowles has been uh, somewhat of a, uh, it's been a very different kind of journey from uh, uh, the academic journey in audio and the journey in video games in the sense that the consumer audio industry is a lot about uh, solving problems at scale, especially large number of devices and volumes and uh, engineering problems that are uh, driven by the economics of scale. Uh, what excites me about uh, talking about this topic at ADC is that it seems like it's a very exciting time when uh, audio user experience is becoming ubiquitous. And it seems like some of the problems that were really interesting only to people who were solving or designing niche audio systems, not really looking to build something which is uh, on a large scale, economically speaking. It seems like a lot of those problems, particularly in terms of building the infrastructure for it, are also becoming relevant problems for consumer audio engineering where it seems like the economics can really drive uh, building out this infrastructure um, in, a, in a better way. So I'm, I'm excited to be um, connecting with ADC on a personal note uh, in, because of my interest in audio. And I think I can relate a lot to the audience here. And um, I'm constantly, you know, if, if not becoming much of a musician, I'm constantly acquiring uh, gear. I, I think a lot of you can <laughs> relate to that. And so as a pro audio consumer and as a consumer of um, audio software that's written uh, for niche audio products, I, I can, I'm very excited that some of these problems that are coming from consumer audio are starting to uh, intersect with that. So that's uh, sort of my motivation for coming here. I also have sort of, it's, it's great that I can come here um, to represent Knowles in a way. And I think this is possible because some of the problems that we're solving in consumer audio are starting to intersect with uh, the audio development community here. And so there's, uh, there's an additional angle to my interest in coming to ADC, which is that it seems like now the audience at ADC, uh, maybe this was always true, but this may be more true now that the audience in ADC, uh, a, a lot of you may be people who want to develop some of these solutions and it, it may not be sort of deviating from your purpose to do some of the solutioning that happens in consumer audio. I know that a lot of people in the uh, niche audio space, we like to stay true to our purpose. 
and uh, we even managed to not let the economics sort of pollute our designs, but it seems like now is a great time to be uh, maybe taking some of the skills from niche audio products and applying it to products at scale. So yeah, with that motivation, I want to get uh, started. So the topics that we're going to be looking at today, uh, I'm going to be sharing some introduction on why we should care about low power, some aspects of low power design and development, and then I'll quickly uh, jump into how does that look like from a specific use case, which is a low power audio front end. And uh, if you get time for it, and uh, a couple of times when I went over this, it seems like there, was, there wasn't a lot of time left for machine learning, but maybe we get through this faster today. And uh, I go over some notes that are specific to machine learning. Maybe a lot of what I'm talking about Accelerate is common to DSP and machine learning because it's uh, a lot of the benefits come from the architecture and the design and uh, the common uh, sort of math problems you know, implementing math on a low-power processor, and it seems like there's a lot to be shared between DSP and ML, but there's a few specifics for ML. So yeah, the first, uh, I'm gonna go over a few trends, and uh, this is in light of what I was saying earlier, is that voice and sensor processing is becoming ubiquitous. And I think we've already seen this sort of foretold in a lot of uh, movies and narratives previously. Uh, and it, it was always thought, and maybe everyone could relate to this fact, that the easiest way to communicate with machines is a natural user interface, and voice being a primary modality, uh, but also communicating with gesture could be another natural way of communicating with machines. And I think a lot of earlier user experience revolved around human beings making uh, the effort to understand how to communicate with a machine. And the dream was always that uh, we would be able to communicate with machines the same way that we communicate with people. And that maybe machines also enable us to do some forms of multimodal communication that were not possible earlier. So just some examples, there's uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, Star Trek, Star Wars. These are all things, you know, I, most of the ideas that are rolling out today it seems like they were all foretold in the movies. So there's something that we can learn from there. And also it seems like some of those things, they were science fiction, but it seems like a lot of them are unrolling uh, day after day, and uh, it's becoming a reality. And some trends, uh, if you look at the graph there, it's mostly about IoT consumer devices. I know IoT is a bit of a buzzword, but in this context, when I say IoT, it's mostly voice-enabled devices and consumer IoT, which is uh, you know, speaker boxes and uh, television sets and anything that has a voice user interface. And th there's very rapid growth in that, and it seems like some of the things that we saw with previous uh, user experience uh, changes, uh, sort of revolutions, we're seeing a similar trend with voice now. And so audio is starting to take a very central role in the way that we communicate with uh, machines. So if you see the number of mics in every household, is, uh, it's exponentially growing year after year. And it seems like we're going to have hundreds of connected devices in a single household by 2025. And for all of these devices, the most natural modality for interacting with them is voice. And it seems like new user experience on one hand, and this is very tightly connected with AI, is driving a significant increase in audio and sensor subsystem components. And this goes back to, I, I think the most intuitive way to relate to it is again, you know, it seems like the movies, where the more natural the user experience needs to be, the more intelligence it needs to have. And a lot of this intelligence needs to be sort of built into the device. And of course, there's multiple layers of the intelligence, and we'll, we'll look at it later. But it seems like a lot of that intelligence is coming directly onto the devices that we're connected with. So what are the enablers for this? Is uh, microphones and sensors are key enablers. Specialized audio and sensor, you know, what, what, what's being called edge processors. And there's DSP and ML software in these consumer edge devices. There's also DSP and ML software on the cloud, but we'll look at how you know, uh, these are different from what's happening on the devices. There's also analog circuitry that complements this digital hardware and software. 
both for audio and sensor processing. Just another look at all of the uh, devices that you have in, in your living room and in a, in a household. Could be TVs, thermostats, connected appliances. And uh, all of these, the, the most easy way to interact with them is the uh, voice user interface. Again, there's uh, two aspects to why um, low power is important in these contexts. One of them is that a lot of these devices are battery operated, and having this kind of processing in order to interact with the device, this processing needs to be always on. It needs to be always listening, uh, both for audi audio and sensory inputs. And that's very expensive. That's one thing. Even for devices that are connected to a wall outlet, it seems like, it seems like it's a good idea not to waste power, uh, first off. And also, there's, you know, there's regulations that incentivize uh, a lot of the OEMs to not waste power. And one, one example like that is the uh, Energy Star regulation. Mobile phones, we're, we're already used to it. And uh, it seems like a lot of the new UX is also starting to come on mobile phones. Voice user interface is one of them. But there's also a lot of other audio use cases that are driving innovation in mobile devices. And uh, that goes back to some very traditional use cases like noise canceling, video recording, and uh, voice capture. And both mobile and wearable is sort of the other um, avatar of this ambient intelligence that we carry around with us. So there's an intelligence in your living room, and then there's the intelligence that you carry around on your, on your phone. And it seems like some of that intelligence is also coming onto devices that, um, that are sort of augmenting your overall interaction. So it could be like a, a wearable, like a headset or an augmented reality device. All of these are starting to have the same intelligence embedded into them. So the point I want to make here is that there is a strong case to take all of that processing and optimize it and save energy there. So some more classic mobile audio features. There's uh, uh, closed talk, whisper mode, wind noise, and wind noise and distractors. These are all like traditional audio processing use cases. Far field capture, selfie mode, conference mode, and last but not least, voice assistants. So the challenges here are distance, position, sound quality, wind and noise, directionality, echo, and power consumption is something that comes across all of these use cases. And the elements of a complete audio, audio solution to attain this natural user experience is uh, high-performance microphones, multi-mic solutions, smart microphones, advanced audio algorithms, and high-quality DSPs and audio processors. When I say audio, it's really audio and uh, sensor processors. So next trend, you know, sort of connecting the dot from what we just saw is that a lot of the times we think that most of the processing for interacting with intelligent machines uh, that, are, that we have today and that are coming up and they're getting more and more intelligent, most of this is on the cloud. But in fact, the cloud, first off, is not an unlimited reservoir of uh, compute. There's, there's limitations and it seems like the cloud is not able to catch up with the amount of compute that every person needs. And just as an example, if to look at the order of magnitude, there's a, if, if there's processing that needs to happen on the cloud, it, it could happen on a very general purpose machine and consume watts and take and have a latency of around hundreds of milliseconds. Whereas on the uh, device edge, and maybe I should define this a little bit. So I think the terminology that's being used today is that there is the, the cloud, which is sort of uh, the most distant piece of compute that's accessible to you. Then there's the cloud edge, which is sort of the part of the cloud that is closest to you. And then there's the device edge, which is the application processor and the main processor that's there on, the, on all of the devices that you carry. And then towards the end, we have what's being called the edge of the edge, which is uh, very small specialized processors that are sitting right at the sensors, which is right at the source of data. And so this is very similar to sort of memory hierarchies in computing, where the the farther you have to move data, the more it's going to cost you. So 
uh, it's going to cost you in terms of power and it's going to cost you in terms of latency. And uh, there's also privacy, which seems to be something that is stealthily snuck up upon us, which is that the farther you want to send your data, the more you're not in control of it and the more it becomes sort of very, uh, uh, very gray as to uh, how to regulate that data and how, how do we ensure privacy. So again, the order of uh, the latency, the order of the latency at the edge of the edge could be something in uh, milliseconds or even microseconds for uh, some kind of processing. But if you have to incur the overhead of going higher and higher up in this chain, it's going to become more and more expensive. The last trend that I want to talk about, which um, sort of really uh, brings the uh, immediacy of this to the front is the uh, end of the road with Moore's Law and uh, Dennard Scaling. So just to recap, I think maybe many of you know this already, is that Moore's Law basically is just, uh, it, 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 it's not really a law, but it's just a prediction that the number of transistors in an integrated circuit will double approximately once every two years. And it seems like this is, we're almost reaching the uh, physical limits of this. And although I think the premise behind Moore's law was that people are going to keep innovating and they're going to come, keep coming up with new ways of uh, leveraging physics through new forms of engineering, and they're going to break this barrier every two years, it seems like we are really reaching the end of the road there. The second thing is, um, again, uh, many of you might know this, is that as transistors get smaller, the reason why we reap benefits is that the uh, power density stays the same. And this is also starting to come to an end as we're starting to approach the physical limits because the assumption behind Dennard scaling is that the leakage and other static effects don't dominate. And as we're starting to see, as we're coming to the end of the road, it seems like the static effects are starting to dominate a lot more than the uh, uh, dynamic you know, behavior that Dennard scaling uh, takes for granted. So one of the, uh, so there's, there's uh, new innovation that people are doing, uh, and I think uh, there's uh, maybe still some hope that we may be able to uh, go past Moore's law, but um, I, I don't think we should be holding our breath. And what this means is that this old concept that we can write software a certain way and we can design very generic hardware. And then just because of improvements in the way that we make chips, we keep getting more and more powerful chips that operate and that operate faster at a higher frequency and do the same compute for the same power. This is, this is no longer a, a, a workable paradigm. And what this leads to is that we need to optimize in ways, and most of the time optimization means looking at the specifics and uh, trying to squeeze the most out of it, which means that we need to move away from this sort of very homogenous architecture where everything is computed the same way and we're riding the free lunch that we got from physics and we have to start looking at each one of those problems and see how to optimize them in a very specific way. So yeah, this brings me to the second part, which is, um, it seems like we're dealing with some very deep problems. So what does this mean? If, if, if any of you want to get into low power development, are you going to start looking at the physics of new manufacturing processes? Or are you going to design your own chip? It seems like there's a lot to take on if you want to reap the benefits of low power. So I just want to, uh, it, it may be fun and it may be a worthwhile investigation and I'm sure it's very exciting, but you don't have to do this. And uh, th there's a lot that you can reuse. And I just, you know, this, this illustration is just that if you want to be Tony Stark and you want to build everything yourself, maybe you can, but you don't have to. So I'm just going to go over each uh, layer of the uh, design uh, hierarchy and uh, look at what you can reuse at that layer of the design hierarchy. At the uh, lowest level, there's the fabrication process that I was talking about, and it seems like there is innovation that's coming in, and you may be able to reap the benefits of some of this innovation if you choose an SOC that you, uh, 
if you choose an SOC to accelerate your compute, the first one is that there's chiplets, which is basically a way for uh, developing an ecosystem of companies that are optimizing specific functions in a chip and then being able to stick them together and uh, use 2D and 3D packaging techniques to integrate them into a larger integrated package. There's also nanophotonics and biocomputing and a bunch of other exotic uh, innovations which are really early in, uh, in very early stages of development. Uh, as we move into the more realistic part of SOC design, I think this is where uh, the, re the reason I want to go into this is if you are going to be choosing an SOC to accelerate your compute, or if you're building a device that um, might benefit from this compute, what is it that you're getting from this SOC? So most SOCs leverage knowledge of the domain, so which is basically audio, signal processing, and sensor processing to optimize compute memory and peripherals. So this could include, for example, internal audio, signal, and uh, data buses. The data bus itself is designed in such a way that it does not dissipate power. And the more traditional optimizations, and I think this is a very general pattern that uh, some of you may be familiar with, is that the basic paradigm of designing an optimal system of chip is to make an instruction set that's optimized to run more complex operations in a single cycle. And once you've figured out how to use the parallelism that's inherent in that operation to make it run in a single cycle or in a fewer number of cycles, it means that you can now afford to operate this chip at a lower frequency. And once you're able to operate it at a lower frequency, this means it consumes lower power. There's a, there, there's a wide range of other techniques that are used in the system on chips, including having multiple voltage and power domains, which means you know, having different parts of the chip operate at different voltages and consuming only the amount of power that they need instead of having a uniform amount of power consumption across the entire SOC. There's also frequency and voltage scaling, dynamic frequency and voltage scaling, which is basically checking how much of compute you actually need and then running that part of the chip only at that frequency. So if, if you have a chip with a bunch of cores and there's, a, there's one core that you detect is only needing a certain amount of compute, then you lower the frequency at which it's operating. And once you lower the frequency at which it's operating, again, you can, op you can afford to run it at lower power. The last one is to have uh, highly tightly coupled memories on chip. And this goes back to this idea of the closer you are to the data, the, uh, the, the less power that you dissipate. And um, using a cache may be one way to do it, but very often a lot of system on chips will have an SRAM or a single cycle uh, memory which will save you power. So the next level at which you design energy efficiency is at the audio or the sensor subsystem itself. So for example, if you were uh, building a battery-operated toy and uh, you know that there's a few modes in which this toy operates. So there is, you, you understand the various modes of operation in which you expect the toy to be in. And if there is like a very low power mode, you understand the signal flow for how far how, how far can you optimize this? I mean, do you really need to move the data all the way to your main processing chip when you're, when, when, when you're in the super low power mode? That's one thing. The second thing is, is it pre or post processing? Can you move your SOC closer to the source of the data or can you move your SOC closer to the destination of the data? But one example of this could be if you were doing some filtering for the audio front end, then you, and, and that's the only case where you want to be optimizing for power, then you move it closer to your sensors. And if you're doing some output processing and that's the only thing that you're doing, then you move it closer to the destination. And in both cases, it may be possible that if you have a hardware design done in such a way that uh, the inputs and the outputs don't need to go to the main processor when it's in the uh, very low power mode, then you get away with a lot of savings in power. So yeah, the basic question that you need to ask yourself is, is the does the application need processor need to be involved? And do you need to distribute your work workload between the application processor and the SOC? And in some cases, it might mean that the application processor is running and you've offloaded some compute to the SOC. In many cases, you may be able to optimize more greedily by having only the SOC run and the application processor is not at all woken up when it doesn't need to be. 
So the final level at which uh, you can leverage heterogeneous compute is in the application and in your algorithm code. And uh, I, I think very often people think that the only place, uh, the only thing that you need to be interested in when you are solving uh, the problem of power dissipation is the code that you've written, and that if you can really optimize this code, then you've solved your problem. But one of the things that we always see, and I'm, I'm speaking mostly from my experience at Knowles here, is that people stumble mostly with the system design issues and with their architectural issues more than with their code. Because I think the ways that code can be optimized is somewhat well understood, and there's always a bunch of code ninjas who can get in and who can understand the instruction set fairly well, and they can optimize that. But it seems like it's, uh, it's a mistake to think that just by optimizing your code, you can save power. So uh, saving power is, uh, it's a, is, a mu is a much more holistic problem, and I, I think it really helps to sort of uh, shift focus and question your fundamentals. And that's the reason why I'm starting off with the fabrication process. It doesn't mean that you need to understand each one of these and become an expert on them, but it really helps to do those basic checks to see if you're choosing the right technology, if you're choosing the right processor, if your subsystem is designed. If, do you really understand your use case? Does it need to spend power in the places that it's spending power? And a lot of common sense questions can get you a very long way before you get to optimizing your code. And you should still get to optimizing your code, but I just want to uh, emphasize that understanding your system architecture is just as important. So yeah, uh, talking about choosing your SOC and uh, where to offload your processing, one of the uh, most common questions uh, that we're faced with when choosing an SOC is, should I choose a floating point core or should I choose a fixed point core? And it seems like the, uh, the answer for a very long time was if you want to be low power, you should choose a fixed point core. And this was sort of a no-brainer. But it seems like the times have changed. And uh, floating point hardware is getting more and more efficient. That's one thing. The other thing is that floating point was always synonymous with full IEEE 754 support. And this is not really needed in the case of many applications that are relevant in uh, voice and sensor-based interfaces. And it's possible for many applications to make do with uh, lightweight floating point. So basically tweaking uh, floating point to use matissa and exponent bits in a way that is relevant to most of the uh, perceptual, um, in a way that preserves most of the perceptual information. and. Uh, based on relevance to audio. For example, the, the second very important optimization is to get rid of all the uh, exceptions, or most of the exceptions that are used uh, in the floating point support. And what this does is basically makes for a very simple floating point unit that operates um, on, on, on a lot less energy. And what this gets us, basically, is that you get to use the you get to have a development process that leverages the ease of development that comes from doing things in floating point and uh, still gets you the kind of power consumption that you would expect from a fixed point SOC. So some uh, ex ex examples, uh, some of the NOLS SOCs, I can give an example. We don't use uh, NANs and denormals, and uh, there's a lot of simplification that's done in the floating point hardware to make it very low power. And the power consumption of these floating point units is extremely competitive with the uh, power consumption of fixed point units. Another uh, interesting um, approach is that a lot of people have code that they're already running, and uh, maybe it's already in fixed point. And uh, when you look at an SOC, you see that it has all the audio interfaces that you want, and uh, it's overall, it's looking like an attractive option, but you're on the fence and you're wondering, um, are you really going to be making that port that you want to do? And uh, one thing to consider is if you can get a core which has support for both 
And uh, ideally, you want it to be in floating point as you move forward, but maybe you start your port off with fixed point if the core supports it. So that's something that you want to put on your checklist, is to see if, if, if you can get a core that does support fixed point, and maybe you can port to it as, as, as a first pass, and uh, check the overall integration with the framework, and if your solution is behaving the way it should, and then in pieces you move the parts of the code that you want in floating point. Yeah, another you know, uh, important option to consider is if you want to offload not to a separate SOC but to a low power island on the main processor. And in some cases, this could be a solution and it's worth considering. Uh, but if you want a dramatic improvement, then chances are that if you are offloading to something that's on the main AP, you're going to be faced with a lot more constraints in terms of how far you can push the uh, low power, uh, how far you can juice that chip to get more performance for low power. I'm just going to quickly go over some standard DSP features. I think this may be something that all of you have come to expect. but. Uh, just as a checklist, and for maybe people who are not very familiar with this, the, the standard DSP features that we've come to expect when we want to offload audio is being able to do load and store in parallel with actual compute, single cycle, multiply, accumulate, efficient circular addressing, and uh, zero overhead loops. And we, we pretty much take these for granted, and you want to check if the chip that you're choosing has all of these features. I think going over this checklist becomes particularly relevant because uh, when you're shopping for a low power chip, it may be possible that you're sometimes looking at chips that are not even a standard DSP. Maybe you're looking at a microcontroller class uh, SOC and it has support for some of these things and uh, many of these chips are coming out nowadays and many of them already exist. It's possible that you're looking at a chip which is not a full traditional DSP. And if some of these items on the checklist meet your needs, and it turns out that you can get the performance that you want, maybe you can get away with making uh, a, a cheaper or a more low power choice. And, and it means that even if it wasn't a traditional DSP, maybe you only need a subset of those features. The next step on choosing your SOC is additional audio specific features. and. Uh, checking to see if the SOC supports energy efficient input and outputs for the most commonly used audio um, data interfaces, including I2S, PDM, and SoundWire is sort of going out of uh, fashion nowadays, and it seems like SoundWire XL may replace that. But you want to check if the peripherals that you have in your design, uh, the interfaces that they need, do they need additional interfacing? So if, for example, you have a PDM microphone and your, uh, the chip that you're connecting to to offload only supports, it does not support PDM, then it means that you're going to have to use some other way to sort of convert it and so on. So you want to make sure that as much of the functionality that you need for your subsystem is already present in the SOC that you're choosing. And why this is important, again, for uh, low power is that when designing an SOC for low power, it makes a lot of sense to put all of the logically related functionality in one place with the compute and the memory. And so there's a, a strong case for the players in the ecosystem to look at compute, memory, peripherals, and uh, all of the other things that are related to that domain. And when I say domain, I mean, for example, an audio and sensor hub would have all of the things that you need for audio and sensor processing. Whereas if you chose a more generic SOC, it may be possible to get away with it, but you want to check what your design constraints are. So uh, the, the other thing is that SOCs nowadays are going beyond the traditional DSP features, and this is where you sort of reap the benefits of very domain-specific heterogeneous compute, which is to take large operations and design them in RTL to be very power efficient. So this goes back to the very you know, early remark I made about uh, how the end of Moore's law is forcing us to leverage better hardware design, basically. And when I say hardware design, I mean better design at the uh, gate level, where 
all of the operations that we were using very generic hardware for, now on a case-by-case -case basis, we can revisit them, and then we can see, can this be realized with more power-efficient hardware, and then turn that into an, an instruction that uh, runs in fewer cycles, and therefore is more power-efficient. Power so one example is having sine and cosine math kernels uh, implemented as uh, in instructions. So another important consideration with uh, choosing your SOC is the end-to-end uh, -end latency. And the end-to-end -end latency, um, I had a chance to catch up on some of the ADC talks. I haven't really been following them for some time now, but uh, once I started planning to attend ADC, I, I, I noticed that there was, a, there, there was a couple of conversations last ADC, or maybe a couple of a, a, a times back, where uh, the, all the layers and how they add up to latency were shown. And one of the reasons for choosing an SOC is that you can put your compute closer to where it needs to be, and you can bypass all of the layers that it needs to pass through in, before it can actually reach the compute elements. But if the SOC itself does not meet your latency requirements, then uh, that would beat the purpose. So you want to check that you've put your SOC in the right part of your signal chain. So for example, it shouldn't be that if you want a very low latency pass, Path, it is somehow going through your AP and coming back. That would make no sense at all. It's, it's a lot, it makes a lot more sense if it can be done directly on the SOC, connected directly to the sensors. There's also the framework latency. So if there is, um, and there's, there's an audio framework on the SOC and there's an audio framework on the AP. And depending on your use case, you will need to sort of do a little calculator for all of the different paths that your signal is passing through and sum the latencies and see if it's uh, meeting your requirements. So some interesting notes here is that uh, there are some important algorithms where the user experience or the technical constraints need it to be very, very low latency. Uh, and it could be single sample operation. One example is automatic noise cancellation, or ANC, where um, if the latency is not in a microsecond range, then the user, I mean, basically, it's not even doing its job. It's, it's not going to have the user experience that you want it to. Another one is uh, PDM uh, decimation filtering, is that if you don't have hardware-accelerated, low-power, PDM decimation filtering, then it's very likely that you're going to dissipate a lot of power just getting your signal uh, from PDM onto, uh, onto your code. And uh, a, lot, a lot of times, the microphones tend to be in PDM, so this is something that's very useful to have and to put on your checklist. So another common question is the uh, memory architecture of the uh, SOC that you're choosing. And a question that's often asked is uh, whether or not you should choose something with a cache. And uh, without going too deep into the details, there are performance gains that you can get from having a cache. But it can be very tricky to program. And if you don't uh, program it very carefully, and you have a cache miss, then it can result in very unpredictable performance. So that's the uh, downside. And supporting hardware for um, effective cache utilization, the hardware support that's required for it can itself be very power hungry. And this includes things like the Snoop control unit. And so a lot of SOCs that are focused on low power will have a very tightly coupled SRAM type of memory that's on chip and it also guarantees single cycle operation, which means that you can do away with having to do all the tricks for the uh, cache-friendly programming and just use the SRAM. So I'm just going to quickly go over, uh, going back to this, um, what I was saying earlier about all of the things that you need to consider. I'm sorry that this might be a bit of an eye chart. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide. But I, I'm just going to go over all of the steps that uh, you would go over and the, the places where you want to be asking all of the simple questions that will help you to get uh, low power. And this is sort of what the developer workflow looks like when you're uh, choosing a platform for low power. So the first thing you would do is that you would get a, an evaluation kit for the chip that you're choosing. 
And it's possible that in the beginning, you might just choose something in the approximate category that you want to evaluate. So for example, if you want to choose a specialized audio SOC, you would get an evaluation kit for that specialized audio SOC. But maybe before you do that, you might have thought that you can get away with using an MCU grade device, and you get an evaluation kit for that. And once you get the evaluation kit, you do the initial porting of your algo to the number formats and uh, you leveraging the instruction set. And uh, you, when you've done the initial port to the instruction, the target instruction set, and you leverage the, maybe the first port that you do, you start off with your floating point reference code. And uh, once you've got your floating point reference code running, if this is a floating point core, that is. Uh, and I, I just want to like take a step back and say that it's, it's very possible for you to have a, uh, development uh, environment that is that that is leveraging floating point and use an SOC that's floating point today and um, it, it's a very common design choice to make so a lot of the things that I'm saying here is uh, focused on floating point yeah you're you're also fixed point is also an option that's available to you but I'm, I'm saying a lot of things here that are uh, basically floating point oriented so the initial porting of your algorithm would probably mean that you uh, write a scalar version of your code to target the chip, and then you leverage the intrinsics to factor out the portions that are already supported as uh, a single instruction for that uh, uh, SOC. The next step is basically the MCPS and the memory uh, optimization. And although you want to, you want to reserve your power consumption uh, measurements to actual hardware, there's a lot that you can do with the simulation environment. Just going to do a quick check on the time. Yeah, so I'm, may, maybe I'll just go over this really quickly, is that um, there's two aspects to the lower power design. The first one is uh, developing your algorithm to target uh, a low power SOC. And the second one is designing your hardware in such a way uh, that your subsystem itself is low power. And the first, one, the first part mostly concerns writing your algorithm in a way that's optimized for low power. And the second, the second part is mostly about designing your hardware and your subsystem to be low power. So things you might want to take into consideration, and you can shoot yourself in the foot on many of these steps if you're not paying attention. And this is what I, uh, I see as a very common experience for many developers, is uh, thinking that you only need to worry about optimizing your code. So I, I just want to emphasize that one more time, is that the more uh, attention you pay to all of the steps of your integration, the more likely it is that you're going to come out with a successful story of having offloaded your compute. So I'm going to go over some basic uh, uh, notes on offloading ML. And while I was uh, writing up some of these slides, a book has come out uh, from Pete Warden. And I think it's Daniel Situniake. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't put that there. Uh, and it's called uh, Tiny ML. And I, I think they've done a much better job than I could have possibly hoped to do in many of these slides. So I, I, I will share this uh, link in the resources, but it's it's a great book to look at if you want to offload uh, ML compute. So I'm just going to go over some quick numbers uh, here in, to get an idea for what kind of power savings you might have. So there is uh, the power consumption of an ARM Cortex-A9 CPU could be somewhere between 500 to 2,000 milliwatts. Uh, a display might use 400 milliwatts. An active cell radio might use 800 milliwatts. And a uh, Bluetooth radio might use 100 milliwatts. On the other hand, an, a microphone sensor could use 300 milliwatts, and a Bluetooth low energy might use 40 milliwatts. I, I think the point of all of these numbers is that when we're talking about uh, building devices that uh, can run on very small form factors or building devices that run on a battery for a very long time and do compute, we're talking about uh, running running this compute on a device that com consumes under one milliwatt of power. And sometimes it's in the order of 
uh, hundreds of microwatts, sometimes it's in the order of tens of microwatts, depending on what uh, mode of operation you're in. So in the sleep or the deep sleep mode, you could be in tens of microwatts or a couple of hundred microwatts. And in, when you're doing significant processing, and I'm, I, I might have time to do like a very quick demo if it works, uh, is you can have um, keyword recognition and low vocabulary ASR and acoustic activity detection and a lot of non-trivial use cases running on a really small device with very little memory and very little power consumption. So, uh, and, and many of these use cases involve offloading ML. So um, I, I think we're running out of time, but I'm just gonna go over the uh, basics of offloading ML compute. Uh, I, I think the sort of the rationale behind why ML becomes a very um, good candidate for offloading is that it, th there's two aspects to it. One is that if you think of each node inside of a neural network as being some sort of an atomic compute element, it seems like there's a lot of redundancy built into the network itself, which means that it's very tolerant to um, inaccuracy. And it seems like if the computation on one node is going a little off, the network itself is very robust to handle that inaccuracy. The second thing is that the training process already in involves noisy input. Uh, it's still a very like, hand-wavy, intuitive explanation, but it, it works for me, so I, I, I hope it helps you understand that uh, there's a lot of redundancy built into neural networks that make them a very good candidate uh, for doing very low precision compute. And this is more true for the inference than for the training. And in most of the cases that you want to offload, uh, you're in inference mode, and this inference mode can make do with a lot lesser precision. It's uh, maybe a little bit uh, more involved to actually map a model that you've trained in a framework of your choice to um, target a more power efficient architecture. Some uh, basic optimizations that you can do, and uh, this is easy to do because it, it's a linear mapping, is that you can map only the weights to an 8-bit data type. And uh, the next step, which may be a little more tricky and might uh, involve some more work, is mapping both the weights and the activations. And the commonly accelerated kernels that are available in SOCs for ML specifically are uh, matrix vector multiplies, and that's sort of the, uh, the core that uh, becomes the basis for ML accelerate. Apart from matrix vector, vector multiplies, the last uh, uh, class of functions that are commonly accelerated are the activation functions and the nonlinearities. So that's about it. Uh, that's all I had. Uh, in conclusion, what I want to say is uh, that it seems like battery-powered devices, uh, we've seen a lot of them changing the shape of our lives. And on the row above, uh, there's some of the, uh, I think, loved battery-operated devices that we've seen in consumer audio. And on the row below, I'm, I'm seeing that there's a trend towards a lot of mobile prosumer devices that are also running on tiny batteries. And uh, my hope is that by connecting with you and sharing some of these thoughts, uh, some of you may be inspired to build the next battery-operated device uh, that does non-trivial things uh, with very little power and changes our lives. Thank you.